Hello viewers, this is An American Thinks, and my discussion topic for this video is the Horn of Joramin, also called the Horn of Winter. It's the horn that when sounded will supposedly destroy the wall, or destroy Winterfell, or wake the giants from the earth, something like that. Uh, there's a lot of speculations on the horn in the books, as well as among fans, and I've done my best to provide as many links as possible to other fan theories in the description below. The last time the Horn of Jormund was supposedly seen was thousands of years ago. It's not like the wall itself, or the children, or the others, which are all things that have legendary origins, but which continue to exist into the time of the books and are consequently observable, and which we can theorize about based on our observations. The Horn is something much more ambiguous, an ephemeral blip in the history of the world of ice and fire that would probably be otherwise unimportant except that some characters in the world think it's very important, and we're given a few tantalizing horns as possibilities, so we must examine the evidence. And in any case, it's a fun exercise if nothing else, so let's take a look at the options, and before we go any further, let me give my standard disclaimer that I present my theories in the context of the books, and not necessarily the TV show, as the canon of the show is known to diverge from the canon of the books. Now, the first option is that the horn is a huge red herring. It's simply a stray bit of legend passed down from the Age of Heroes that some characters, and consequently some fans, take to be reality when in fact there is no truth to it at all. It's an easy conclusion to make since so much of the history that comes from the Age of Heroes is incredibly implausible. In all honesty, in spite of the remainder of this theory video that I'm about to present here, I personally believe there's a very good chance that this is the correct explanation. But what if it isn't? What other options do we have? It's at this point that we ought to just go ahead and address the notable rift in the Song of Ice and Fire community between those fans who believe that the story is a true high fantasy story complete with functioning, albeit uh, rarely seen magic, and those fans who believe that the story is a science fiction story masquerading as a fantasy story. And any theorist who appears to come down on one side or the other of this debate is open to criticism from the offended side, to which the offended side will almost certainly respond. Viciously. It's seriously almost as bad as the Caden versus Ashley fan wars. I discovered this when I posted my theory video on the others, and I happened to use the term technology a few times during the video, which no small number of pro magic fans seemed to find very offensive, and the reaction in the video comments actually became somewhat heated and went something like this. What are you, stupid? What's the matter with you? I apologize. What's the matter with you? Sorry. What the fuck is the matter with you? Run away! Please run away! Won't somebody please think of the children? Kill them! Kill them all! <laughs> So, since I'm making a full-spectrum inventory of the possible explanations for the Horn of Joramin, let me say for the sake of completeness and for the mental stability of the pro-magic fan base out there, I agree there is a possibility that the Horn of Joramin is magical. It is a magical horn created to destroy a magic wall and wake magical giants from the earth, which may very well be ice dragons. This concludes my theory video. Thank you for watching. See you, space cowboy. Now for the rest of us, what if the horn is not a red herring, and what if it is not magic? What plausible explanation based on science, or at least science fiction, could explain the horn? It's a tough nut to crack, and we could start from any number of angles, so let's just start at the beginning. Page 147 of The World of Ice and Fire offers a fairly concise summary of the pertinent points relating to the horn. The first king beyond the wall, according to legend, was Joramin, who claimed to have a horn that would bring down the wall when it woke the giants from the earth. And aside from one stray reference to the horn possibly blowing down the walls of Winterfell, all the references to the horn that appear in the books essentially recycle variations of these same points. That is, that it is a horn, it brings down the wall, and it wakes giants from the earth. 
Now, Alt-Shift-X is the first YouTuber that I personally saw who points out that this phrase, woke giants from the earth, appears again in the world of ice and fire, this time on page 237, discussing the breaking of the arm of Dorne. This story provides many more vivid details, saying all of Westeros shook, great cracks appeared in the, in the earth, hills and mountains collapsed, the sea rushed in, etc. Undoubtedly, this describes a major tectonic event, and it is certainly easy to believe that something of this magnitude could have the capability to bring down the wall. And this becomes even more interesting when we consider that the children tried to do the same thing to the neck as well. And if we look at a map of the wall, which is generally said to be around 300 miles long, and we compare this with the arm of Dorne and with the neck, we can see that these three areas cover roughly the same distance of 300 miles. It's almost uncanny, like the continent of Westeros conveniently narrows itself down to these three choke points, or continental fire breaks, if you will. But what we have to ask ourselves is whether there is some kind of tectonic event that could be caused by, or at least triggered by, humans, or children, or whoever gets their hands on the horn. Well, we do have examples of man-made earthquakes. Uh, take, for example, the case of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, located in the northeast of the Denver metro area, which the United States Army acquired during World War II and used to manufacture chemical weapons until 1969. These chemicals included white phosphorus, napalm, mustard gas, lewisite, chlorine gas, and sarin gas. Nasty stuff, and the manufacturing process uh, produces a lot of other nasty stuff as byproducts. And here's the interesting part. During the 1960s, a deep injection well was built on the site where they could dump all the nasty byproducts. The well was about two and a half miles deep so that it could be below any plausible groundwater used for human consumption. But the well was only used for a few years because it was believed to have triggered a series of earthquakes in the area, something like 1,300 earthquakes over the course of several years. The story does have something of a happy ending, though, following major environmental cleanup by the U.S. government. The site has become a wildlife refuge. It even has a herd of wild buffalo that live there. When I moved to Colorado, the first place I lived was fairly close to the arsenal, and I've been hiking there several times. It's actually a very peaceful place, and you wouldn't have any idea that there was such horrible stuff sitting in the ground below. But as far as being a good analog for the Horn of Jorman, or the breaking of the Arm of Dorne, this model breaks down pretty quickly. The earthquakes supposedly triggered by the deep injection well at the arsenal were relatively minor. Colorado has long been a fairly inert state where tectonic activity is concerned. The largest earthquake on record for the state was in 1882 with a magnitude of 6.6, .6, and the earthquakes triggered by the well were far less significant than this. And in all honesty, I have a hard time believing that an earthquake would be a great example for what we are trying to describe here. As I pointed out earlier, we're talking about land areas with a diameter of some 300 miles or more. We don't have a record of an earthquake completely obliterating an area this large. Even the most powerful earthquake on record, the 1960 Valdivia earthquake in Chile, though very damaging around its epicenter, didn't come close to obliterating a 300 mile diameter area, much less submerging a 300 mile la wide land bridge. And though we do have records of earthquakes submerging pieces of land, such as the Port Royal Jamaica earthquake of 1692, uh, these submerged land areas don't come close to a 300-mile diameter either. So could an earthquake knock down a 700-foot-tall, 300-mile-long wall of solid ice? Frankly, no earthquake that we know of would come close. Localized damage, certainly, but the whole wall, no. Uh, so next up is the possibility of volcanoes, which admittedly would fit into the theme of ice and fire very well, and we do have some known examples of supervolcanoes capable of this volume of destruction, such as the Yellowstone Super Caldera located in Yellowstone National Park in the United States. The caldera itself measures some 50 miles across, and the three times that this area has erupted before, most recently some 630,000 years ago, the affected areas have been massive, However, there are a few problems with the volcano theory as well. First is that volcanoes generally add matter to the areas they affect. Uh, between the ash, lava, and other volcanic matter, land mass generally increases. So it wouldn't be a good explanation for the breaking of the Arm of Dorne, where the land supposedly disappeared into the sea. And it wouldn't be a good explanation at all for the attempted breaking of the neck, either. 
and while a volcano could certainly melt the wall, it would also have extremely detrimental effects for a huge surrounding geographic area, and anyone in the vicinity would be at extreme risk of death. Additionally, if you uh, have visited Yellowstone, you'll know that there is no doubt that there is volcanic activity in the area from the many hot springs to the smell of sulfur in the air to the effect on the weather even in winter and so on. And there isn't anywhere near the wall that exhibits this type of environment. You could point to the hot springs around Winterfell as probably the closest possible example of this, but Winterfell is well away from the wall. And finally, we don't have any demonstrated method for humans to trigger supervolcanoes in any case. So I'd say this possibility is fairly unlikely. And somewhat in the same vein, I'd say that tsunamis, while known to cause extensive surface damage on land, aren't known to permanently submerge 300 miles of land either, much less 700 foot tall ice walls. So although they make a reasonable explanation for the attempt by the children to break the neck, they're not really a great explanation for breaking the arm of Dorne, or for an attempt to break the wall. And finally, we can try applying some literal technology to the problem. For example, YouTube theorist Preston Jacobs, who has long been a proponent of A Song of Ice and Fire as a science fiction story, has theorized that the long night was some kind of nuclear winter. Now, I don't purport to subscribe to this theory entirely, since nuclear winters have other side effects aside from just making everything cold, but while we're on the topic, we may as well discuss a potential nuclear solution to the wall, since that seems to be the type of science fiction solution to everything. Need a man-made earthquake? Drop a nuke in there. Need a man-made volcano? Drop a nuke in there, and so forth. But there's a problem with this theory as well. There have been many underground nuclear tests conducted, and while they do make a big bang and the effects can turn into significant localized ground movement, they don't produce anything on a scale like what would be needed to bring down a structure like the wall. To do that, you'd need a whole series of nuclear explosives, essentially a concerted sapping operation underneath the wall. Now with this said, let's pause on this line of reasoning for a moment and talk about something that I personally never liked about the wall. Essentially, the wall is a huge glacier, though it is shaped like a wall rather than like a frozen river, but it has a lot of functions similar to a glacier, including one in particular that George R. R. Martin mentions several times during the course of the books, and that is that it melts. George R. R. Martin tends to call it weeping, but what we've seen through POV characters is that the wall does melt. Now, I don't necessarily have a problem with the wall not melting away over time, much like glaciers in our world, they are replenished by snowfall during the winter, and particularly during the long winters of Westeros, the snow could replenish quite a bit of height to the wall. But the problem I do have is that in our world, when glaciers melt, they turn into rivers. Now granted, this is typically because we have glaciers and mountains and the melted uh, water flows downhill. But when you have a wall that is 300 miles long, and it spends all summer weeping, I'd expect to see the wall surrounded by rivers. And since there aren't any rivers, the area around the wall ought to be a huge swamp or bog or something, which would be awful land for trying to build castles on. But there's none of that either. There are also a few hints from the place names used uh, at the wall. Among the ruined castles along the wall, there is one named Woods Watch by the Pool, even though there is no pool, and another castle named Deep Lake, even though there is no lake. Now those of you who own the Lands of Ice and Fire book may point out that the map of the wall shows a lake near the ruins of Deep Lake. But I would respond that before the release of the Land of Ice and Fire, there was no mention of this lake, and none of the original maps from the series show this lake. And it would also be pretty unusual for someone naming a castle to say, hey, you know what would be a good idea? If you go to the other side of this huge wall, and you ride for about a day or two north, there's a lake. We ought to name this castle after that lake. I guess I just don't buy that. I think the more likely explanation is that the wall is being actively drained. Now, of course, for this to be true, there would need to be a system of tunnels underneath the wall to carry the ice melt away from the area. And it just so happens that there likely is one. Jorman is the first king beyond the wall mentioned by legend, but the second king beyond the wall was named Gorn who used a network of caves to cross underneath the wall some 3,000 years before the time of the books. Not much amounted to the invasion because they were defeated by the forces of Winterfell and the survivors got lost in the caves trying to get back to the other side of the wall. Now, it would be easy to write this off as just one more unsubstantiated myth, except for one more piece of evidence 
And for this one, let's talk about dogs. Specifically, this dog, called the Irish Wolfhound. It is a giant breed of dog that is very impressive if you see them in person due to their immense size and appearance. And as the name implies, they hail from Ireland and were used for hunting wolves. And they were good at it. In fact, they were so good at it that the last wolf in Ireland was killed by a pack of wolfhounds owned by Mr. Watson of County Carlo in 1786. And then, sadly, without a job to do, the wolfhounds themselves nearly went extinct, and if it weren't for the efforts of a few dedicated fanciers, we wouldn't have this breed with us today. And this isn't the only example we have of wolves being exterminated from a country. For example, by 1960, wolves in the continental United States had been hunted to the point where their only remaining habitat was in northern Minnesota and the Michigan UP. Since then, the United States has undergone reintroduction programs and preservation efforts, and today the range of wolves has been extended significantly. But if it wasn't for the specific preservation efforts by humans, wolves could have been easily driven to extinction. And it's not just wolves either. In my state of Colorado, grizzly bears have been extinct since the last one was killed in 1979. It was small and underweight and was apparently hungry enough to try to attack a bow hunter who managed to stab the bear with an arrow and kill it. Prior to this event, grizzlies had been assumed to be extinct in Colorado since the 1950s. And today, their range in the continental United States is limited to Glacier National Park and Yellowstone National Park. One of the ironies of biology is that large predators, although they're very appealing to us because of their size and potential for kinetic force, have a hard time surviving as a species because they require an immense amount of calories to survive, and they spend just about all their time looking for food. And when they have to compete with humans for food, their populations dwindle because humans take over their habitat for agriculture, and they also hunt them to protect their agriculture. So, in Chapter 1 of A Game of Thrones, when Theon Greyjoy says, there's not been a direwolf sighted south of the wall in 200 years, I have to believe him. If there had been a wolf the size of a pony living south of the wall, humans would have known about it. They would have seen the effects of a gigantic wolf trying to feed itself, such as is mentioned when Nymeria makes her escape and lives with a pack of wolves in the Riverlands. So somehow, a direwolf made its way from north side of the wall to the south side of the wall to end up near Winterfell. And the only way I can realistically think of to accomplish this feat is through Gorn's way. Now, as I was putting this theory together, it occurred to me, if Gorn's way really is a series of subterranean tunnels that drain the water coming off the wall, then we'd have to expect that it would be a very wet place. So the dire wolf that was found in the opening chapter of A Game of Thrones ought to show signs of having been very wet. So I went and dug out my old paperback copy, opened it up to chapter one, and I found this description. Bran's heart was thumping in his chest as he pushed through a waist-high drift to his brother's side. Half buried in blood-stained snow, a huge dark shape slumped in death. Ice had formed in its shaggy gray fur, and the faint smell of corruption clung to it like a woman's perfume. And this wording is very specific. Ice had formed in its shaggy gray fur. In, not on, in. I'll grant that they find the wolf in the snow, but if you've ever owned a northern dog breed with a thick double coat like a husky or a malamute or an akita or Norwegian elk hound, etc., and you've taken your dog out to play in the snow, I'm sure you've noticed that the snow gathers on your dog's fur, not in its fur. Plus, this wolf had been dead for some time, long enough to lose its eyes and be crawling with maggots and for it to be half buried in the snow. So the body has been cold for some time as well, so it wouldn't have had any body heat to melt the snow in order to form ice. Whatever water was in its fur, it had to have been in the fur before the dire wolf died. This wolf walked through something wet. And again, I think this means Gorn's way. So if you were someone who wanted to bring down the wall, you already have half your job done for you. All you need is to go down into Gorn's way stash some explosives, light the fuse, and then you'd get something like this.
So my personal belief is that the horn of Joramin is most likely a red herring, but if it's not a red herring and it's not magic, then most likely it's an intentional demolition of the wall using explosives placed underground, i.e. in Gorn's way. It's pretty much the simplest explanation. Humans have been sapping walls for hundreds if not thousands of years, and there is precedent for this in both the books with Ares II planning to blow up King's Landing, and in the show with Cersei actually blowing up King's Landing, or at least part of it. And if Gorn's Way really is full of water, an explosive effect may utilize hydraulic pressure to blow up large sections of the wall. But how would all of this fit the legend, you might ask? Well, let me explain. Way back in the Age of Heroes lived the 13th commander of the Night's Watch. One day he looked out his window and saw a woman with blue eyes and with skin as cold as ice, and he thought, damn, that's a cold-ass honky. So they started an empire together, which made the Starks mad because they had just fought the Battle of the Dawn to avoid crap like this. Meanwhile, Jorman, the king beyond the wall, figured, hey, maybe I can use this to my advantage and get my people past the wall. So he went to the children of the forest and said, hey, if you make me a bunch of those explosives that you use for your hand grenades, I'll take all the humans with me to the other side of the wall, and you can have all the land above the wall without us bothering you anymore. And the children think, sure, these humans are annoying anyway. Let's get rid of them for good. So Jorman takes his men through some secret tunnels underneath the wall, and he stashes all of his explosives down there, and he leaves a few men behind, saying, If you hear me blow this horn, light the fuses and run like hell. So Jorman shows up at the Night Fort just in time to fight the Night's King with Brandon the Breaker, and they win. And then Brandon says to Jorman, Thanks for your help, buddy, but you've got to go back now. And Jorman says, How about no? And if you try to send me back, I'm going to blow this magical horn and wake giants from the earth and bring this whole wall down. And Brandon's like, Psh! Magical horn, I don't believe you. And Jorman's like, come at me, crow. And he blows his horn. Except maybe he's too far away and his men don't hear him. Or maybe the children screwed him over and made him a bunch of duds. Or maybe he didn't have enough explosives and he just damaged the wall a little bit or whatever. But in any case, it didn't work quite like he hoped. And Brandon the Breaker was like, I'll take that horn now. Okay, thanks, bye. And the whole thing became a legend and was mostly forgotten about until 3,000 years later when the second king beyond the wall named Gorn found some little neat tunnels and he was like, hey guys, I think this goes under the wall. Let's go check it out. And when they came out the other side of the tunnel, the king of the north was there and he's like, nuh-uh, you guys go back like you did last time. And then the whole thing was mostly forgotten about again and became a legend again. Until another 3,000 years later when some pregnant direwolf who just so happened to be the sigil of House Stark and who just so happened to be pregnant with just the right amount of puppies mysteriously went into the same tunnels and was coincidentally found on the other side of the wall by the King of the North and all the Stark kids were like, yay, we get puppies! And meanwhile, Bloodraven is sitting inside his weirwood going, yes, now all these Stark kids can practice their telepathic abilities. This is freaking awesome. Thank you all for watching. Please feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments below. My next theory video will be about the God's Eye. Did that go the way you thought it was going to go? Nope.